Kalofa lava, tēnā koutou. Welcome to the second Raising the Bar Home Edition. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Karen Thompson from the Alumni Relations Team at the University of Auckland. Taking research and education out of the lecture theatre and into city bars is what Raising the Bar is all about. Raising the Bar Home Edition takes it to a step further by bringing the latest scientific research from the University of Auckland right into your home. This year, we bring you six fascinating topics and six amazing speakers. We started last week with Associate Professor in Marketing, Mike Lee. He talked about anti-vaxxers and COVID-19. To watch the talk, you'll find the recording on our alumni website. In a few moments, we take a different look at education when Dr. Jemima Tiatia C gives us an insight into her personal experience as a minority working as an academic in a predominantly, predominantly white university. Our MC tonight is your colleague, Zoe Henry, a PhD candidate in Pacific Studies. Zoe's research investigates how punishment in the Pacific was transformed by contact with European explorers and missionaries, a future raising the bar topic, I'm sure. Zoe will introduce Jemima and we'll keep track of your questions to be answered later. So make yourself comfortable with a drink of your choice and enjoy the show. Over to you, Zoe. Uh, kia ora, Karen. Uh, e na mana, e na reo, e na hau, e whā, e na matua katoa, huri noa i te whare nei. Uh, no mai haere mai ki tēnei, Zoe. Uh, kia ora, whānau. Uh, welcome to tonight's Raising the Bar webinar with the incredible Dr. Jemima Tia Tia Seath. Uh, my name is Zoe and I have the pleasure of being your MC tonight. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, um, we've got a few house rules to go over. Um, you'll notice on your Zoom screens um, that there is a Q&A function, which is now live. Um, you will be able to submit uh, questions for Jemima at any point while she's talking. Uh, myself and two members from the alumni relations team will be monitoring these um, while she's talking. Um, you'll also be able to upvote uh, any of the questions that come up, um, and these will be moved to the top of the Q&A screen. Um, and the questions with the highest votes uh, will be answered um, by Jemima uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, our speaker tonight, um, it, it's really, really cool to introduce her and, and really hard to because there's so many things that she has done. Um, our speaker tonight is known for her extensive work and service in the mental health and wellbeing space. Uh, she has worked and served in multiple spaces while also teaching at the University of Auckland. Uh, she's the current co-head of Te Wānanga or Waipapa, the School of Māori Studies and Pacific Studies at the University of Auckland. She is of Samoan heritage and has a public population health background. In 2018, she was one of six panelists uh, on the New Zealand government's mental health and addiction inquiry and is currently a commissioner for the inaugural Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission. Her expertise lies in Pacific studies, Pacific health, mental health and wellbeing, suicide prevention and postvention, health inequities, climate change and youth development. Uh, she has also held various governance positions, including uh, as a current member of the Health Research Council of New Zealand's Public Health Committee, and as a previous member of the Mental Health Foundation's Suicide Bereavement Service Advisory Group, the Health Promotions Agency's National Depression Initiative Advisory Group, and the Health Quality and Safety Commission's Suicide Mortality Review Committee. Whew. That is our Jemima. Without further ado, Fano, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jemima Tiatiasi. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, kia ora koutou, tā lofa lava, whakilofa lai atu, Māori, kia rana Nisa Bula Vanaka, Māro Lele, tā lohane, and warmest Pacific greetings. Again, uh, ngā mi Zoe for your introduction, I really appreciate that. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to tune into this Talano with Zoe and I, where I have the opportunity again to speak candidly about my personal experiences and to provide quick fire insight into what it is like for me as a Pacific academic woman. Some of you here attended the in-person rendition of my Raising the Bar talk some weeks back and or I have listened to the re recording of that talk on Radio NZ. So there may be a rehashing here of some of, some of the points I raised in that earlier session. Now from that time to this evening, there's been a lot to unpack. Not just for me personally, but for all those who have been impacted in various ways, both Pacific and non-Pacific, and across the globe. 
And by this, I refer to a poignant moment where after I had delivered my initial talanoa or my talk, it was then aired a few days later. And in the wake of that release, I received a seven minute tirade, which was left on my voicemail and which completely reaffirmed in quite an extremist way the very points I had touched upon in my talk. And I've found there is so much irony in that. I'm doing well, and I've received amazing aloha, aroha, love and support from family, friends, colleagues, the Faculty of Arts and the University of Auckland. Thank you all who are here with me tonight for your love, prayers, support and concern also. You can access this tirade on, sound, on SoundCloud. It's in two parts entitled Racist Rant. And please be warned, it, it's not pretty. There's also a link to the original Raising the Bar Tananoa, I did, should you need some context. And the team here can provide you with those links. The content of my previous in-person talk, and as I had mentioned then, was always going to be quite challenging for me. And the fact that there were layers that were unearthed and some quite vulnerable moments I had shared in order to provide some perspective on my experiences and possibly has been the experience of like-minded peers. One of the last points I, I brought up in that talk was that in sustaining good leadership, one has to be able to take the hits, to have some real resilience and be prepared for the haters and the criticism. And this couldn't ring any truer than when I received that hugely misinformed voicemail, although I, I, I wasn't surprised. Those who have experienced racism would agree in fact, that voicemail provided the perfect example of the type of racism people of colour are subjected to on many occasions. And this example just happened to be next level vile. As confronting as that voicemail was, it actually highlighted what some people think. And yes, Aotearoa is not immune. Now, to be invited back, one may think that I'm quite the sucker for punishment. But this is the thing, if you're passionate about serving your people, all people, celebrating success, uplifting and nurturing the greatness that is all around you, giving your role 110%, then that dead skin of the past needs to shed itself very quickly in order to generate a much thicker growth of skin for the next phase. And this I consider is what it takes to be a leader. So who am I? As I shared in my initial talk, it would be remiss of me to delve into my experiences without first acknowledging Nanny, my grandmother, Suresa Gavin, and my mum, Joyce Tiatia. Some of you already know the story of Nanny's arrival as a 25, 26 year old into Auckland on a seaplane. And my mother who was born in Mankino. Two mighty leaders in their own right and very strong and courageous beings. I identify with the villages of Tanga, Salilunga, and my Musu in Samoa. I was born in Tukaroa, here in Aotearoa, and a product of May Road Primary, Grayland Primary, Avondale Primary, Avondale Intermediate, and the formidable Avondale College, and have lived the majority of my life in Waitakere, or West Auckland, and still to this day reside in the area. So what do I consider this talk important? It's not so much about me and my story, but rather the sharing of examples and thought, experiences that aren't unique because I believe they're shared by many. And for the purposes of this talanoa, experienced also by those in the academy and more precisely, Pacific female academics. Again, I'd like to reiterate that there is a growing evidence base exposing huge inequities that exist for Māori and Pacific academics who historically have been underpaid and underpromoted in Aotearoa New Zealand universities. In fact, as I mentioned before, Māori and Pacific women academics earn on average around 7,700 less than non-Māori and non-Pacific men, and we're 65% less likely to be promoted to associate professor or professor. 
This research undertaken by the likes of my colleagues, Dr. Tara McAllister and Dr. Sidiana Naipi, along with others. So I pose these, quest these questions, what message have we been sending to those aspiring to reach the higher echelons of academic excellence and service? What are we pre preparing for our postgraduate students, for early career researchers? It has to change. I believe in evidence-informed practice and action. So this growing body of research around these inequities gives me hope. The proof is right there. It's as real as that voicemail I had received. It's just not right. And it's not even that complex. It's actually quite simple. And it has been blatantly obvious that there are power imbalances, that institutional racism is at play, and that there is a firm maintenance of the status quo, all which are very much still alive. My university and my faculty are attempting to steer the ba'a, the waka, the canoe in a new direction, and I'm hopeful that this direction will be a whole lot more inclusive and culturally safe. I understand it won't happen overnight, but the languaging is starting to shift, and I think my university and the Faculty of Arts are taking a real solid lead in this. Now, if our institutions and many organisations, bodies, and agencies in New Zealand declare that te tiriti of Waitangi, of Waitangi is foundational to the bones and spirit of their being and function, then it needs to be completely understood that it is one thing to say it and quite another to do it. So the challenge, although not unachievable, is that the right people are involved right from inception, right through, to well after our lifetime. That will enable an, an environment that is safe, tika and pono, true and authentic, and clears the way, not just for Māori, but for all. And as a Pacific academic, I see myself there and, and I feel I belong. It is the case for many women in academia that work-life balance is not an easy pony. Personally speaking, and speaking on behalf of most specific women, our tautua or our service is of, of the utmost importance. That is a true measure in my eyes. And it takes considerable skill, nuanced understandings, cultural intelligence and time. And I've said this before, and that our service to our students, our communities, families, our children, our peers, our churches, our nation is nowhere near given the recognition that it deserves. And all this, I believe, ultimately has a significant bearing on our academic careers, which then transpires to our students. Instead, this immeasurable service is seen more as extras. Now, because of this, we're on the daily grind striving to meet expectations. Expectations that advantage some more than others, and have traditionally been framed by the powers that be. The powers that are far removed from what it is to be a Pacific a brown female academic. I understand that much of this cyclic machinery is globally and nationally motivated, but since when has Aotearoa ever been shy of being the first in the world to ignite action, and driven by women at that? The current system has for a very the current system has a very, very long way to go. We're measured in a way that doesn't ever quite capture the relational and holistic self. It's a framework that sidelines, that muzzles and restricts. There are rules and I get that, but one doesn't have to exclude others or trample on the mana of others in order to progress. So what have I learned and what am I, what am I continuing to learn? Academics are deeply embedded in a system that rewards our efforts, basically in some instances to please others and within a paradigm that for the most part sets us up to fail and yet continues to prioritize privilege. This isn't a moan, it's our reality. I'm not crying out for support. 
a word I believe is deficit-based in any case. What I'm making quite clear here, here is that I'm advocating for equitable processes, resource and outcomes. The absolute vision is that there is no further harm caused. That is the starting point. I've learned that it's okay to go against the grain at times. And whilst that might not be the most popular move with others, how does one expect to be a shaker and a mover by being a passive observer? Respect is one of the core values of being Samoan, being Pacific. And whilst you do what you need to do to make moves, that doesn't mean you forget your values or firm Pacific foundations to advance. And I don't speak of the advancement of self, but rather the advancement of the collective and for our babies, not just in the now, but in generations to come. Just as we preach to our students to be proud of their identities, to celebrate who they are and, and, where, they are and where they're from, I too need to be proud in mine. And by that I mean taking pride in being a brown female leader to be fearless and effective in the space and in the time you've been given. Because you're only a seat warmer, as harsh as that may seem. It's the truth. So don't get too comfy and know when to give up that warm seat for those coming through and be absolutely secure in that. I take pride as a Pacific academic in the types of spaces that historically positioned me on the periphery before I'd even entered the room. So I take pride that I can take my rightful seat at the table, that we can take our rightful seat at the table. I've learned to chill out when needed, but gauge the timing of when to roll up the sleeves and dig deep, and when to mic drop. Reading the room is necessary. And I don't mean an emotional read, that's totally not my forte, but rather in the professional sense. Unfortunately, too, to be comfortable being uncomfortable and that one shouldn't feel bad or misplaced. Because for decades, Pacific female academics have sat in that discomfort. What does it mean for me to release Pacific potential? I owe my presence to the sacrifices, advocacy, protection and fight that was endured by my ancestors, the migrational aspirations and dreams of my grandparents and parents, all of which have led me to this place. The point here is quite plain and simple. Success breeds success. And if you can't smell success, or it seems far-reaching, especially for a Pacific woman in the academy, you must realise that it's not a you problem. It's the environment, and it isn't right. Don't get me wrong, academia is fiercely competitive, and I'm no stranger to that, nor do I despise it. Well, I actually love it. But one can't compete fairly if one is purposely locked into the starting blocks. One of the main goals in academia is to produce scholars who will positively give back and are the critics in consciousness of society. And what comes to my mind is the imagery of a conveyor belt on a factory line, tuning out mass production of a highly educated population where some don't quite make the cut, or at least to packaging and shipment, but are instead tossed to the side where no one will ever get to experience those gifts and rich contributions that could have been, or not seen as conventional, and now are invisible. My primary goal, however, is to be an, an enabler and an and in an environment which facilitates the growth of Pacific thought leaders, Pacific brilliance and academic success, an outcome we know as Pacific peoples that changes the lives of so many families, that digs people out of ruts, whatever those ruts may be, whether it be economic, those experiencing mental health challenges, for example an environment that releases student and staff potential. 
that dispels stereotypes stereotypes and has zero tolerance for any form of discrimination. My sister and her business partner own an urban streetwear label that goes by the acronym DMRP. Don't let your mind rob your potential. And that's just it. That's the goal, irrespective of where you sit in the ranks of academia. This is what it takes. As the academic head of Pacific Studies, and as I described in my previous talk, it's a discipline that flips the scripts and reclaims our Pacific narratives. Pacific Studies is a powerful discipline. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. I, I have an arts and population public health background, as Zoe had pointed out. But it wasn't until I did my postdoc in Pacific Studies and then became academic head of the discipline, that I realized just how much I didn't know. The point is that Pacific Studies is a place that really sees me over my entire academic career. It really sees me and privileges my critical thought, my advocacy, carries my voice and the voices and spirit of those before me. It's provided me a platform, it has opened doors to more leadership opportunities than I could have ever imagined. Imagine this being something all Pacific and Indigenous academics and professional staff could feel right across our universities, both national and global. Thriving environments such as this releases our potential. And I'm mostly speaking here to architecture, engineering, law, fine arts, health sciences, medicine, science, design, you get my drift. Tokenism doesn't bode well with me. So unless you're in a room and at a table that doesn't come with this type of agenda, you're all good. It is seeing the value in people and enabling that meaningful contribution that they make not as someone who merely ticks your box. Um, so how do I deal with fatigue and, and decompress? Work overload can often distract us from the things we're meant to be doing. But at the same time, you're in a bind. Because as a Pacific academic and as a woman, I find that I'm obliged in some cases to say yes. Because as I said in my previous talk, if you're not there, then we're not there. The fatigue can be eased if we see active growth in the workforce, where the numerous responsibilities um, you know, are shared and we all carry and, are not a, and, and aren't carried by only a few. Letting go and trusting my people has somewhat eased the fatigue saying no to some things and not feeling bad about it has taken me a while to learn. But as a Pacific person, it's really not who I am. My purpose is to serve and I draw strength from that. It is what I'm meant to do. But in having a background in mental health and well-being, self-care, taking time out to breathe, and just learning tomorrow worry about itself, that all takes the edge off. But I, I do want to leave you with this point. In saying that, my ancestors, our ancestors, didn't sail miles across the moana so I could stop for a rest. We, along with our allies, have a lot of work to do. And thank you for sharing this night together. I will now hand it back to Zoe to lead us in our Q&A. Thank you. Hoo-wee. So many uh, nuggets there to, to sort of unpack. So nā mahi kia koe, Jemima, for your mahi and this talanoa. Um, I think what you've really kind of captured here is the, the complexities and, and, and the struggles, um, but really just kind of the, the beauty of being brown and, and female in these spaces, you know? Um, and I think personally for me, coming through coming through these spaces, um, it's real mean knowing that someone else has already kind of gone ahead and has already started kicking down doors and has started taking names. So um, 
Cheers, Mema. Um, but I'm going to turn this conversation to our audience at home. Um, and we've got some real mean questions here. So um, our first question uh, is, uh, you talk about cultural safety. Um, what are the unsafe situations you've experienced? Um, how have you raised them um, so that they have been taken seriously? And how have these been responded to? So what have been the unsafe spaces and how, I, how have I dealt with them? Mm -hmm. Um, probably the most unsafe space I've ever been in is when it's like blatantly racist um, in the room, right? Um, and you call it out, you know, uh, unless, I mean, if you're just going to sit, sit around and just be quiet about it, you're almost being complicit. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I roll. And so it is calling it out. And you don't have to be nasty about it. You don't have to bring violence to the situation. Um, it, is, it is talking through those issues, although at times that brings me to another issue in that, you know, we shouldn't have to explain to those who are not in the know um, to help them understand or relate. You know, it, it's tiresome. I mean, we've done that for years and years. And so it's up to those that aren't in the know to go out there and find out for themselves rather than expect us to do that for them. So that's one. Um, the invisibility um, in, you know, in certain situations, I find that is unsafe. Um, yeah. So are there like specific people with that that I can get a list? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we'll go on to our next question uh, from Emmeline. Um, so she has asked, uh, being a visibly brown Pacific woman in academia who is high achieving and at the forefront of these conversations currently, uh, does it ever get too much knowing that everybody wants a piece of you uh, because you are one of very few? How do you navigate that space? Mm, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The answer is yes, it can get too much. Um, but like I said, like I said in my Talanoa, you know, you, you have to draw strength and really dig deep and try and remind yourself of why you're there and, and, and your purpose-driven life and who you represent, your family, mm -hmm. your, your workplace, your students, you know, um, all those before you. You know, they, what a waste of time if you're just going to be in this current space and just be blasé about it. You know, when you're given, when you're given the mic, you know, you take that opportunity and you speak loud and proud. Some speak louder than others. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hope that's answered. And, and, and keeping your loved ones around you and those that really have your back, I think that's really important. Cool. Um, we have another one here. Um, how do you think we can teach? Uh, nope, that keeps moving. How do you think we can teach other schools, faculties on how to create thriving environments like Pacific Studies? Um, and is this even possible in a Pakia dominated institution? It's completely possible. And I think a start is that, you know, there needs to be the workforce um, that is reflective of the population that we serve. Um, it is working closely with, uh, with other faculties, um, something that Pacific Studies has, has done since the dawn of time, and that is collaborating, that is teamwork, that is working in team, you know, collectively. Um, we never work alone. Um, I think once you start working alone, you're, you're in trouble and you make huge assumptions. And so I think for those areas that are predominantly um, mainstream, it's important that you get on board, get on the waka, and seriously um, work together. Yeah, so, in, yeah, increasing the capacity in the workforce. Um, and the research is showing also that, you know, we make a minute um, percentage of the staff population. Okay. Um, okay, cool, we have another question. We have another question. Um, what advice do you have for sub PhD and PhD candidates um, who are trying to figure out whether academia is where they should or need to be? Hmm. Okay, so when you pursue a PhD, it's you, you can't 
quite escape academia, right? Um, uh, so what, what are we trying to say here? Um, when, you, when you partake in, in a PhD, uh, you have to be driven in many, many ways. So it has to be a topic that you are completely passionate about because it, you know you've got to keep up that momentum in in the in the area and so it's a lot of consulting um bringing on board lots of mentors you know don't ent entirely um rest on the responsibilities of your supervisors get a real hub around you a team and continue to bounce off and i think you'll know fairly quickly whether academia is for you or not but I guarantee you, it's it's the best thing that could ever you know happen for for a student because it completely opens so many doors, and it gives you an in not just in mainstream but also in our Pacific communities because there's lots of mana, lots of respect mm. and honor around you know attaining a PhD and you know for the three to six years that you. Uh, engaging in your PhD, that's nothing. Honestly, it's nothing. It's compared to what it does for you for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And by that, not just a lifetime, your lifetime, but also the lifetime of your local and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably the thing that I'm learning kind of coming through this, right? Like it's not, it's never just about you. It's about who you're bringing through and who's on your back about things, right? So, yeah. Um, I think just leading on to that question, um, I had a, a question for you. Um, just because we've got uh, an increase of our of our younger rangatahi coming through, um, and they're going to undoubtedly experience these sorts of sort of conversations and, and microaggressions and you know those those, those not so all good um, spaces. Um, do you have any advice for them on how to sort of handle those those conversations for themselves? I mean the. The institution, institutions like um, universities can be quite daunting, not only for you, not only for staff, but students as well. And so, I think it's important that students, you know, look to your tōkana, you know, look to those who are probably in, in positions that are more senior mm -hmm. that can speak on your behalf. Because at the end of the day, no student should be left alone, and you shouldn't have to go into an institution thinking oh my gosh i've got to fight yeah and, and you know yeah the di you know power dyna dynamics that are at play i mean you know we we need to enable our students to feel that they are completely supported mm -hmm. and that they do have people that are gonna you know jump in the ring and put on the gloves and not bring the violence okay <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we've got a question in our uh, Q&A. Um, for us older Pacifica, who in many ways were part of a generation who didn't learn the stories of the language uh, and don't have a deep understanding of culture, how do you think we can start our journey towards being more aware of our heritage while not feeling lesser than our Pacifica brethren who are more integrated into their ancestral history? Okay, that's a, probably a talk. That's a big one. In yeah. itself. Um, I talked about being proud in who you are, whatever that may be. Wherever you are on the continuum, mm. it's in your blood, it's in your DNA. You know, those that were before us, they're sitting in the now, you know, and they're also going to be there in the, in the future. And I one day am going to be an ancestor myself. So it is... It is taking pride in that and whatever journey that you're on, that's exactly it. It's a journey. It's it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and if you take Pacific Studies, I mean, you learn all this stuff. It's a true story. <laughs> cool, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a whole conversation in itself, eh? Like, Whew. Um, okay, what advice might you have for non-Pacific staff, non-Pacific staff, me staff members to be better allies and to show genuine care about making space for Pacific early career researchers? Hmm. Again, 
um, ensuring that you have the right people around you um, and consulting. Um, you know, you may think of an idea and be, well, you know, um, think that it is meaningful, but you have to step back and ask yourself who came up with the idea in the first place. The idea, if anything, must come from those, you know, in minority kind of um, roles. Uh, what am I trying to say here? Um, that, yeah, that right from inception, like I said, right from inception, right through to, to the end of a project or whatever, that there is involvement um, and being able to, to, I guess, know when to stand back. Because it will ultimately benefit mainstream in the long run anyway. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but it's a bit of a weird tension between <laughs> it's a bit of a weird tension between having to like um you know take a step back and 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 let us kind of do what we need to do but also step forward and 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 do the work that needs to be kind of done right like it's a and i wonder if that kind of adds to the anxieties that maybe non-pacific or non-indigenous staff might feel kind of trying to be in the space or ally to the space this is actually, that's actually a really good point, Zoe, because, because anything to do with Pacific, we're like pulled, you know, like, oh, yeah. do this, be this, um, you know, blah, 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 just like, you know, going, it's mayhem. Mm. Um, and it can be an overload as well, I guess, not just having one Pacific rep representative, but having more than one. Yeah on a committee, for example. That's just an example. So the, the load can be shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, for those of us with a seat at the table, uh, we all know that moment when you call out the unsafe situation and you get the blank stare and high-pitched defense of white fragility. I'd love to know, what do you do in, this, in that moment? And what is an example where, where your response to this has been impactful? Um, it's being secure and, and knowing that you have every right to be there just as much as the next person and not being, not being mean about it, but being able to draw wisdom, take, take a pause, you know, just not be rah, because sometimes that'll just fall upon deaf ears, right? Yeah. It is just it's pausing in the moment you know, navigating the situation and then being able to, yeah, like I said, draw wisdom. Um, <laughs> that's another tough question. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. I don't know if I've even answered it. Have I? Kind of small. I guess, like, how do you, um, how do you not take on the mummy of someone else's fragility, right? Like someone else's, is showing their, their fragility in these conversations, how do you not take on that mum way of trying to either look after them, make sure they're all good, or being like, you know what, you got this. Okay. Thank you. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm Pacific, and I'm Samoan, and, and my upbringing, um, and it's one of the core foundation, uh, you know, core, yeah, core values of being Samoan or, or Pacific, and that you show compassion, regardless. Regardless of who that person is, there you find wisdom in that compassion and it slows you down for a bit. And then you're able to respond in the most, in a way that benefits all. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I operate. I can only ever speak from my personal experience. Um, and, there's, and I find there's power in that. You don't have to be talking a whole, you know, through a whole meeting just to, you know, it becomes din after a while. Sometimes not saying anything is powerful in itself. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing be patient and don't throw hands. That, that's kind of what I'm hearing from this. Yes, yes. <laughs> 
Um, okay, we have a question. Um, well, uh, we're not being entirely patient because I think we've been completely patient, right? Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like so patient. Um, I, I, I can't, I, I don't know how else to say that, but just be true to yourself. That's all I can say. And if you feel that's the moment to address whatever it is that needs to be addressed, then go for it. But also, also remember one of the other core cool values of being Pacific is humility. And so, you know, that comes with, yeah, it does come with patience, it comes with strength. And not to go into a situation on your own. And by that I mean whether you are, are believe in God, whether you um, are fully surrounded by your ancestors, whatever your spiritual journey is, allowing that to speak on your behalf, it'll come. This is so non-academic, but this is the point, right? Yeah. And that this discussion we're having is exactly the discussion that needs to be had to be able to transform the system. Mm -hmm. It's not a different way, it's another way that should work in parallel with what already exists. I think then we're going to see some real, real shift. Well, I'm, I'm here for it, man. Like, let's go. Like, it's, it's time to change, man. Um, okay. Uh, who are your role models and how have they played a role in your career and life? Oh, my family, 100%. Um, my dad and my grandparents and my mum. Um, my sisters, oh gosh, my family, yeah. that's it. Um, and ha because in each and every one of us, we carry our own stories and our own strengths, our own skills, our own wisdom. And, you know, people speak to us in, in different, in many, many ways. And so when I go to my family for anything, when I'm having the worst day of my life, or when I'm like having the meanest day of my life, they're my go-to. Um, and they're my role models. That's it. Yeah, I think just following on that, because you talked a little bit about self-care in, in your in your corridor as well. What other forms of self-care do you practice being in the space, like having to sort of decompress from your whole ass work day and then going home and you know what 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 do you do in, the, in that time to kind of be ready to see your family well i do have a gym membership and that's about as far as it goes <laughs> but physical activity um pausing you know the mental health foundation has all this stuff and Leva have all the stuff that talks about pausing in the moment um breathing um, going for walks, all, the, all that type of stuff. You're doing the things that you love. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because if, if your brain's anything like mine, which goes handy at times, and and it needs to come down sometimes, um, those those simple things in life really, really do help. Mm -hmm. Meditating, praying, whatever. All that stuff, just... Yeah, absolutely helps in an environment that is so, you know, yeah, high high functioning and demanding. We're all performative too, right? Like you've got to show up and, you know, act up. I think it's a Samoan thing too. It's <laughs> like, you know, I don't care what's happened um, five minutes before you walked in the door, but yeah, you show up mm -hmm. because you don't show up to be fake. That's, that's not a thing. It's showing up because you know you have a space and you have the time and you have a purpose. So when you show up, you make sure you bring your A game. I'm not saying I get it right all the time, but for the most part, mm. you know, it's, it's what it takes to be in academia. And academia is not a scary place. It really is not. It's wonderful, but it is good to know that we can have these conversations to expose some of the things that we don't really talk about, right? Mm -hmm. And like any job, there are loose ends. Yep. Okay, um, we've got time for one more question, um, just because these are zooming sort of through and I'm trying to keep hold of all of them. Um, there's been a lot of questions over um, wanting to know the specifics of uh, when you've called out 
um, racism and when the not all good situations have kind of happened. Um, so there's just one question here that I think is quite cool. Um, and then we've got a few more things to talk about. Um, will things ever be better for young Pacific women wanting a career in academia? Of course, you have to believe that. Because if you give up on that, then gosh, it's not going to happen. But if we are all on the same va'a, if we are all on that, that vibe and bringing that, all this energy, this energy, this Sagittarius energy, Zoe, that we have, if we bring all this energy, of course it's going to change. And as academics, both Pacific and non-Pacific, it's our responsibility to facilitate that, to nurture that. Because if we aren't, then I don't think we're doing our job. 100%, yeah. I mean, you've delivered some real hard and powerful truths tonight. Um, and we've got we've gone through most of the questions and we've still got a little bit of time left. So I'm going <laughs> to um, throw you in front of the bus a little bit. <laughs> um, throw you in front of the bus a little bit. Um, any final words for our... Um, for our whanau that are at home um, listening, um, for our rangatahi that are coming through, um, final words from, from Dr. Jemima Tia Seath. Final words. Um, all, of, all it's been so far is words. Um, all I can give right now, all that I have the capacity in this time right now is to just encourage you to just be fearless mm -hmm. to trust yourself to trust those around you to remain focused to to be on guard to be vigilant and to keep to keep fighting and to keep battling because you are not battling for one mm -hmm. you are battling for generations okay. yeah me um, and I think it kind of ties back to what you said earlier, you know, becoming becoming the ancestor, right? Like, be the ancestor that we, we kind of need. Um, so I think that's, that's real cool. Um, that is us, Fano. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. You could have been anywhere, anywhere, probably not in the world because COVID, but um, you chose to be here with us um, and we appreciate you sharing the room uh, with us tonight. So um, kia ora from, from, from us. Raising the Bar Home Edition is a series of six speakers over six weeks. Uh, today's speaker uh, was the second of the series, uh, and there's four more that remain in the series. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to enjoy us again at the next talk. For more information about this and to catch a recording of tonight's talk, please check the link in the confirmation email that you received to join us today. Um, they'll also show the website address um, at the end of this. Um, shout out to our student crew, Fale Molosi. Uh, take care, whanau. Po marie. <laughs>